Find your future by exploring your world. The Massachusetts School of Law challenges their students to explore the important issues of our time, learning from experts in fields like politics, sports, and business law, from firsthand accounts and dramatic reenactments, in-depth conversations with society's leaders, from historians to lawyers, from high-tech professionals to environmental experts. The Massachusetts School of Law at Andover presents MSLaw.edu. We spend an enormous amount of money keeping people in jail. Nationwide, incarceration costs on average $31,000 per year. Think about that. It's about what an average worker in the United States makes. Virtually everyone incarcerated will eventually be released. The old myth of lock them up and throw away the key has been replaced with rehabilitation and education. Inmates take courses and obtain skills. So instead of being a drag on their family and society, they become contributors. As the sheriff says, Thanks for coming, but don't come back. Hello and welcome to mslaw.edu. I am Michael Coyne, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law and your host for today's show. Today we give you an inside look at the reality of incarceration and the changing role of our correctional facilities. Joining us is Sheriff Kevin Coppinger. Essex County is pretty much representative of most of the correctional facilities in Massachusetts. Um, obviously the Middleton campus here, most of them are male. Uh, we have females elsewhere I'll get to in a few minutes, but um, average age, about 35. Um, predominant um, race is white. I think whites are 42 percent, uh, Hispanics 41 percent, and then black about 11 percent, and it, it you know comes down from there. Um, most of them are from Essex County. You know we do have some other inmates that live elsewhere uh, in Massachusetts as well as uh, out of state. Um, the inmates here, average stay is about nine months. We hold pretrial and sentenced inmates. Pretrial probably makes up about 65 percent of our population. And then the sentenced, obviously, to, you know, the other, the other 35. So it's a busy place. Um, a lot of inmates here from, uh, with a variety of backgrounds. We, because we're a, we're a county jail, you can't, if you're sentenced to something longer than two and a half years, obviously you have to go to the Massachusetts Department of Corrections, but anything less than two and a half years, you can stay in a, a county facility like ours. But because we're pretrial, we have uh, everything from murder suspects to folks who commit armed robberies, sex offenders, right down to um, you know the, the low-level crimes. Uh, we have folks here that are in here for uh, uh, short lobsters, altering, <laughs> altering really? oh yeah, altering a, uh, a lottery ticket, failure to uh, turn on sprinklers in apartment buildings. So there's everything in between. So what is the education level generally? It's high, some high school. Um, not everybody has at least a high school, you know, the diploma. Um, and, and but again, we have a few that have that are college educated. That for some reason, I'm sure we'll get into it. Particularly with substance abuse, you know, they, they ended up in here. Is that the common denominator? Is uh, substance uh, abuse is very prevalent for the prison population? Absolutely. We estimate our uh, at least two thirds of our population has some form of substance abuse, and combine that with mental illness, uh, about. 48% of our inmates here in, in Middleton, or in Essex County, have a form of mental illness also. And a lot of them have co-occurring disorders of, of both uh, uh, types. So the, the jails and the prisons now in Massachusetts have become the, the biggest treatment facilities for both substance abuse and mental illness because of things have changed over society over the last several decades. They closed the state mental health, mental health hospitals. The opiate epidemic is raging and it's causing problems for society and when society doesn't know what to do with problems they can't address right away they tend to call 911 and then the police do their thing and then a lot of these folks end up in jail here where now our mission has changed and we have to do something a little bit different to try to, to fix these problems. Well let's talk about those two problems specifically. If, if an inmate comes in who has a, a drug dependency or uh, is is using drugs. What types of treatment possibilities are there while uh, in prison? Something new started last year when the uh, Massachusetts legislature passed the, the, the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Out of that act was a pilot program that was created for seven counties. We are one of them um, across Massachusetts, and this is really is really groundbreaking for the terms in terms of corrections and treatment, as you just asked. Um, there's not many facilities, and I'm talking on the national level, that are doing what we do today for substance abuse. 
Now, if you look at the opiate epidemic, um, the Northeast is, was hit particularly hard with the heroin and now fentanyl. And obviously that, that, uh, that affects all walks of life. It does, I can tell you personally, just from my experience, it does not discriminate for any reason. Um, so all kinds of folks have it. So what we do now is part of the pilot program, we offer um, three forms of medication assisted treatments. Uh, for about five years now here in Middleton, we offered a, uh, what used to be called a detox program here. We have since renamed it to the Clean and Sober Experience. Um, what happens here is we work very closely with the drug courts in, in the county, particularly in Lynn and Lawrence and now Haverhill. Um, so we work with, it's pretrial, work with the defense counsels, the district attorney's office, obviously pro, uh, probation and the judges. And then they'll come in here to the detox program and they stay 28 days. We have uh, 42 beds for men, 42 beds for women. It's dormitory style, so you're not really in a cell. You are in jail, but you're in a standalone building within the complex. So to quote uh, one of the judges from Lynn District Court, uh, Jim Lamoth, a couple of years ago, he, he referenced it as it gives the inmates a taste of corrections. Mm -hmm. Again, it's pretrial. They can look out the window, they can see general population, but they don't mingle with the general population. Everything is done on, on site. So they come in, yes, they do detox. It's not easy, and it's under medical care. We have 24-7 privatized health care, and we give them comfort medications and food and get them through the, uh, you know, the detox, and then for the next 28 days, we programming. AA meetings, we have guest speakers, just, you know, we're trying to change their lifestyle, get them to think a little bit more positive and get their lives back on track. And then upon the 28 day, uh, when that's uh, finished up, they go back to court with an individualized plan. Okay, what can we do with them? And we work with probation, again, the courts, in order to hopefully, you know, hand them off to a halfway house or some other uh, mechanism. So where the medication assisted treatment comes in, a lot of those inmates, when they leave us, we'll give them Vivitrol. Now, Vivitrol is a, an antagonist, which uh, it's a shot you get every 30 days. Uh, it blocks the receptors in your brain, which is if that causes you to not get the cravings to get high again. Um, it's not cheap. And those shots are about $1,100 oh, per, wow. per shot. Um, we give it you know, 24 hours before they leave, and then we hook them up with facil uh, facilities or, or connections in the local community so they, they know where to go for the next 30 days to, to get another shot. Now going back to the pilot. And those shots then in the future are also either state or subsidized by some entity? Great question. When someone is inside a jail, um, the health insurance doesn't come with them. Right. So we pick up the tab, which means you pick up the tab, which is the John Q. Public, the uh, taxpayers. So one of the things we do um, as part of our reentry program, we, before they leave here, we make sure the inmates get signed up. It's usually on Mass Health, mm -hmm. so we get them that, so they do get that coverage. So when yes, when they leave here, we'll come up with a local health care provider or a doctor, and then Mass Health will take care of the, the cost of those shots for them. So going back to the other two forms of medication-assisted treatment, and I'm going to call it MAT for short. You'll find sure. us in law enforcement. We love acronyms. So, so, <laughs> Education. And, and, yeah, yeah. So, so MAT is MAT. It's just easier than saying that whole thing all the time. But so now we're, we bring in we bring in methadone and suboxone. And uh, suboxone is really, it's the buprenorphine family and the suboxone subutex, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to call it suboxone. So the ir irony about suboxone is people have been trying to smuggle it into jails for a long time. It is the number one drug that we find tr people trying to get in. One strip of suboxone, and if you could equate it to, like if you get down to your local CVS, get one of those um, little strips you put on your teeth for whitening, mm -hmm. that's about the size of like a, a suboxone strip, and that's worth about $200 inside you know, amongst the inmates if they can successfully smuggle it in. So now we're giving it to them. So how successful are the three drug programs at really helping people move away from the use of the drug? Because it's new. We just started September 1st. Um, it's, we're going to collect a lot of data. Um, because, frankly, um, no one really knows. Now, what happens, to actually, to actually go back, back to your original question, when, when an inmate comes to intake, that's step one here at the jail, they, they go through the usual booking questions like, any, like at any police department, but we also give them a full medical screen with health care workers, a full mental health screening. And then if they have a confirmed prescription in place at that time, that they're out with uh, actively participating in a community-based um, program, suboxone, methadone, or even the Vivitrol, we will now honor that prescription and we will give them the medications here. So it's under tight security because it has to follow DEA regulations. Mm -hmm. So, um, And suboxone is a daily dosage, so they have to go over to a dispensary that we just, we're actually just finishing up construction now uh, along with the methadone. 
So what methadone and suboxone, they're agonists. Remember I said Vivitrol is right. an antagonist. So they're agonists. So you're always going to be on some type of a maintenance high. So we'll see where that goes. You know, I'm a little bit old school, I admit. So, um, you know, I think sobriety is a great way to go. But right. I'm also a realist. So I think we'll try these new medications. But it's a little scary because you figure, you know, a lot of these folks will never get off one of those agonist type of drugs. So they're always going to be on that maintenance high. So if you think about it in society, we could have, you know, law enforcement officials. We could have educators. You know, the person at your local uh, who's running your 401k could be on some type of medication, and hopefully it's maintained well and they're successful. But, you know, people in society are always going to be on this high. So that's why we're collecting the data and trying to follow the, the individual when they leave us too, because if uh, if something's going wrong or if they're going falling off the uh, off the wagon, so to speak, and going back to use to drugs. Want to make sure we can adjust whatever we can in terms of medication or treatment or, or counseling here so they are successful so they do come back so it's a three-year pilot program we've only got two months of data so far um, but so far so good but um, you know the kind of the, the jury's still out if you know what i mean right and we'll, we'll get that data as we go forward well, how does an inmate who comes in with mental health issues how do they get uh, treatment for uh, their ills same thing like when you when you come in if if they have a diagnosis or, or our staff picks up on it uh, and, and makes a diagnosis here so everybody gets that initial screening and then if folks get flagged for possible mental illness then we'll make sure they have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session usually within 24 hours when they get here if there's any question that they they have severe mental illness or God forbid they have suicidal tendencies, we will move them up to our infirmary um, or medical housing unit we call it, another MHU to use another acronym. Um, and that way we'll put them on a 24 hour watch until we can do a much more thorough evaluation again with mental health pro professionals. These aren't correctional officers, these are folks who are in their field and know their, know their stuff. And if their medication's gotta be adjusted or what, what it might be, we'll, we'll do whatever we can while they're here. Severe cases, um, we can transfer them to Bridgewater, um, Bridgewater State Hospital, which you know, um, the, um, Governor Baker, I think it was last year, the year before, actually privatized that. So we work with them for the real serious mental health cases. But because mental illness is so prevalent, um, in the last couple of years, we've gone out and we've trained all our staff into uh, what we call mental health 101, first aid, mental health first aid 101. So all our correctional staff uh, have been trained to see signs of possible mental illness, and again, particularly suicidal tendencies. Jail is a tough place to go. Beyond uh, treatment for mental health issues and, and drug issues, what's a typical day for a prisoner look like? I mean, are they, everyone's up at the same time, and, and how does it work? Yes and no. Um, we have, uh, like, for, for numbers, we have about 1,100 inmates here in Middleton, about a little over 1,400 countywide in some of our other facilities. So here in Middleton is obviously the biggest campus. Um, we have what we call the workers, and they're in uh, one of the specific housing units. We call it the 240B. And these individuals up around 4 a.m. and they work in house. They work on, on site here. So most of them work in, in the uh, chow hall. So they'll they'll go over there and they'll help prepare the, f the first meal of the day. Obviously breakfast. And there's other workers that'll come in to do maintenance in the facility or clean up or whatever it may be. So they're up early, and then the rest of the the inmates are up. Uh, you know, six ish, maybe seven ish, uh, depending on what they where they're going. Um, they get three squares a day, three square meals a day. And in between that, um, we do a lot of programming, a lot of treatments. Uh, again, as I said before, if you, um, when they come to intake, there's each, indi each individual inmate has some type of plan um, why they're here. Our goal is to, once they're released, they're released in better shape than when they arrived. So an inmate gets up, he has his breakfast, he may go to some classes. If it's, uh, you asked about education levels, if they don't have a high school diploma, we have programs um, here, the high set. Uh, which is the old GED, mm -hmm. and we'll have them um, participate with you know, educators. Uh, one of the recent changes we just did, I'm very proud of, we, uh, we just contracted with Northern Essex Community College to do our education piece. So now we have professional educators coming in here to teach the, the high set. Um, as well as some of the other um, educational pieces. Can they get, as part of the Northern Essex Community College, can they actually get college credit for some of the work they do beyond the, if, the if high they, set? If they get to that level. Um, we started a program two years ago with Merrimack College uh, where they come in and they do a, uh, a, a class on, uh, it's like sociology 101. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of ironic, and it's a story I tell often, and I admit, you know, being an old school cop, sometimes I, I stereotype people and I, I try to 
I, I try not to do it, but I looked at this inmate come up after. We had a graduation ceremony, and I go in and give the diplomas and, and shake the hands and congratulate him. And, and, and I'm looking at this kid. He's, he's probably like 18, 20 years old, and he's, he's got loads of tattoos and lo loads of holes in his face from the body piercings. And I'm looking at this kid. I'm going, oh my God, he probably has no chance of going anywhere in life. And I admit I stereotyped, and he came up to me, and he got a certificate from Merrimack College. And he comes up to me afterwards, and, and this is no, no, uh, no exaggeration, but he's crying. And he shakes my hand and he says, Sheriff, he said, I never thought I'd get out of high school, let alone ever have a piece of a college education. So I was like, wow. I'm like, I was fluid yeah. telling this kid. So he, hopefully he never comes back to see us, as we tell him. But, um, so, but they don't get, he, he got that one credit course, sure. but because the average stay is only nine months, yep. they can't get much more because by the time we get him in, if they have that substance abuse, we have to get them treated and leveled off so they can, you know, participate in a classroom setting. And then we don't know when they're going to be bailed or be released from the court or stuff like that. So while they're here, we give them as much as we can in, in terms of education. We do, um, we do a lot of vocational training too, because when inmates are here, um, again, like I said before, they're, they're really at the lowest part of their lives. Well, you said some of them are learning to cook. Yep. I mean, what are the other uh, trades that they might learn? A lot of the stuff they do, there's, there's programs for behavioral programs. Now, obviously, you know, we have folks here in the jail who, who, who are violent. So we have a program called Alternatives to Violence that we have a group of volunteers come in and, 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 and speak to the inmates. It's a classroom setting. Sure. Um, so they do that. Um, we, between here and the farm, now the farm is up in Lawrence right on 495. Um, it's there actually it's a pre-release center, but it is a working farm. Um, the inmates up at the farm, um, they, they learn how to you know, farm. We do a new program we just started last year, which has been very, very successful. It's called a hardscape program, where we teach the inmates how to do landscape masonry. Hmm. So we went up and got a grant through the Bureau of Justice Administration, which is the part of, part of the U.S. Department of Justice. We um, we partnered up with Essex Tech Regional High School down the bottom of the hill here and the New England Concrete Manufacturers Association. Now the manufacturers donated all the stock and the, uh, the instructor down here from Essex Tech came and he goes to the farm uh, multiple days a week and he teaches the class on how to masonry uh, walkways, you know, walls, anything to do around, you know, to beautify a, a sure. property. The inmates loved it because, you know, let's face it, a lot of these are young guys, they like working out, and, yep. uh, they're lifting heavy block and moving it around. And uh, because the economy is so good right now, right. you can't hire people in a lot of the entry level um, positions. So once we had our first graduation, you know, we did some media exposure to it and we had, uh, we had co landscape companies call and say, how do I hire these guys? Sure. I, I want somebody like that. So it was a win-win for all of us. Um, so they do that, but we also do um, cabling between fiber optic cabling and the old uh, you know, Cat 5, Cat 6 mm -hmm. cabling. We teach them that. We teach them OSHA classes so they can go in and work in, in, the, in the food industry. Um, you know, we, we have the print shop. We have a print shop up, up at the farm that we teach, you know, how to copy stuff and like the old Sir Speedy companies and now, uh, you know, Staples does and a few of those. So hopefully we're training employees that could, could end up in that industry out there. One of the big things I'm very proud of is we have a work release program that's, that's, that's very, uh, very productive. We have over 100 inmates, again, up at the farm, being the pre-release center, who go out to work every day. And if I could throw a little commercial message out there, <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm always trying to get a little angle here. But um, you know, if anybody um, has need of employees, mostly it's entry le entry level labor, as I said before. But the employer gets a tax break from the IRS if they employ folks who are incarcerated. The beauty for the the beauty about what they do, we pick up and deliver. So if you start your day at 7 a.m. and you have business, he's going to be on time. He's going to be on time, <laughs> and if he's not on time, we'll give you another guy, because the inmates will line up for this. They sure. get paid, they get paid. They get a, a they get a day's wage. Now they don't get paid in hand. You know we get the money. We put it on account farm, and and then when they are released, we hand them a check, and that check hopefully they will use either first month, last month rent if they're getting their own place, or you know maybe they they're, you know they're going to reunite with their families. Whatever they're going to need for money, everybody needs money. So it gives them a little bit of extra step up, mm -hmm. uh, so when they leave us, they, they hopefully can get back to be a productive member of society again. Let's talk uh, briefly about female inmates, because yeah. there really are no female inmates here. Wh where are they housed and why are they housed in separate facilities? Yeah. We have 42 beds here. Remember I talked about the clean and sober experience. Um, so we have, we have 42 beds available for, for them for, for, the, the, uh, for the, uh, the, the substance abuse treatment program here. Other than that, there's no females in this facility. It's, it's obviously majority is male. 
We have a, uh, a, a program up in Salisbury, it's called Women in Transition, WIT for short. Uh, 24 beds, low risk, there's no fences, there's no you know, barbed wire, there's no walls. Um, a nonprofit runs another, uh, a, like, a, like a halfway house next door. Mm -hmm. So it is a correctional facility. We have staff there, but the, uh, there's uh, 24 beds there with the ladies. Um, they stay there, they follow our, 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 you know, our rules and regulations, but they're also out working every day. So same thing, we drive them to work every day, we pick them up. They can go out back, there's picnic benches there, they can sit there, there's some exercise area. So it's kind of that half step before they go back to society. Now, other than that, the only place that we could traditionally house them was in uh, the Mass Correctional Institute at Framingham. Um, if you've never been to Framingham State Prison, it's, you know, it's an adventure, let's put it that way. Um, it's been around for a number of years. It's, I'm sure the Commonwealth's already got its dollars worth out of its, its, uh, its investment, but we had about 100, maybe 110 ladies there um, you know, over the last uh, couple of years. But three weeks ago, we, just, we have moved them to Suffolk County House of Correction at South Bay, right off uh, uh, the expressway in Boston. Now the reason we did that is Sheriff Steve Tompkins, who's the sheriff in Suffolk County, um, his, his, his numbers are dropping, his inmate population is dropping, he has, uh, he has space in there. Um, when he approached me on this, I thought it was an awesome idea. First of all, it's a newer facility, mm -hmm. it's a better facility, and all due respect to the folks at the, uh, the Department of Corrections. It, um, county, county jails and houses of correction provide more programs because we're short term. Mm -hmm. The Department of Corrections, they're long term. They could be there, all life is and everything else in between. So we do a lot more programming. Sheriff Tompkins has similar programmings there. How successful are we with all of the various programs and the treatment option and the education uh, with making sure that, uh, or at least attempting to ensure that these folks don't get, come back to, to visit you? Are we successful? If you look at the criminal justice system, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much here, but most people don't come to jail on their first offense, you know, because usually they start low, you know, the, the, the low-level the low crimes. And, you know, they go through the courts and they get arrested and they get on probation and then they get suspended sentences and, you know, it goes around. So usually they don't come here, maybe fourth, five or fifth offense, serious offense when they finally, finally come here. And then you have to define, you know, what you're asking about is recidivism. You know, what, how do you define recidivism? And different places define it in different ways. So our recidivism rate here overall in Essex County is, is 44%. Now that's down 1% from last year, which is a good thing. You might say, wow, that's not that good. On a national average, it's not bad. But as we said before, what drives the bus here is substance abuse. And what we're trying to focus on is reentry efforts, mm -hmm. or our reentry efforts, excuse me. So we can do all we can here while they're in our custody, but the minute they leave here, um, you know, a lot of them figure out, again, as I said before, they have no family, they're estranged from their family, they have no home, they have no job, um, they're gonna probably live on the streets or in a shelter, and they have no income, so they're gonna go back to crime. So we have to get them back and re-engaged with the community. So we try to do a handoff I mentioned a couple of times we do these individual plans when they mm -hmm. release. We work with the courts. So when someone's actually getting released, we're looking to, to partner up with any local providers, health care providers, social service providers, religious uh, entities out there, obviously city and you know, town governments, whatever they can do to help us out. Um, for example, we talked about MAT and all the medication-assisted treatment. We have partnered up with PARI, which is the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative that based out of Gloucester a couple of years ago, which has been very, very successful. Um, we love money, we love free money, so they gave us a grant. So we have a couple of recovery coaches who, so when someone's leaving here, we'll put them in touch with a recovery coach. They will check on the individual periodically while they're in the community, making sure they're going to their AA meeting or their NA meeting or, or you know, batteries program, wherever they gotta go. And just to make sure that they're still engaged in, in recovery. Um, one of the things I'm proud of here that we do in Essex County are, are the Offices of Community Corrections. We have three, one in Lynn, one in Lawrence, and one in Salisbury. Um, these work both for people who have been incarcerated and folks who uh, are in the court system but have yet to, to set foot inside a, a correctional facility. Um, it's, it's a day reporting place, so you can go in days. We have programming in there, similar to what we talked about here, but on a smaller scale. Do drug testing, that's huge. If they come back positive on a drug test, they're back in front of the judge. Maybe they end up in here. 
but it's just another way to, to kind of keep track of these folks, give them those resources that they need. So again, they, they try to reunite with the family and, and, and keep working. Let me let me ask you a little more about that the classification um, and programming initiatives that you have. Um, the housing now seems to be more uh, in pods. So is that the way we try to keep them separated? Is that instead of one big um, entity here where there's going to be uh, by nature mixing, that they're separated into sort of discrete communities based on whether they're here pre-trial or trial and what, how s serious or violent their offenses may be? That in theory is exactly what we should be doing. Um, here in Estes County, our, our facilities a little old, in, in dire need of repair, so we do the best we can, but we have traditional housing pods. We have cells that are there's two individuals in a cell, two tiers, um, like the 120 building we call it, that means there's 240 inmates in there, 120 cells doubled up. Um, the 240 is four different areas, there's 480 inmates in there. Those are traditional cells. We have an 80 bed unit, which is a, it's not that, that uh, uh, clean and sober experience unit I mentioned before, but it's another drug treatment unit. For, for other inmates who don't qualify to go in that thing. So there's, there's six or eight, eight individuals in a cell. It's less, it, you know, the doors are usually are never, mm -hmm. they're never locked. It's more, it's less um, restrictive, if, if that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so that's not too bad. And then we actually have dormitory style housing. In one of our old buildings here, um, there's, there's bunks, double bunks, and we may put, you know, 80 individuals in, wow. in that room there. It's, is it ideal? No, but it's more, um, you, you classify individuals, you put them in here, so now they're back into that social setting. Mm -hmm. Some individuals are better off moving into that type of an environment because they feel less anxiety and a little bit more um, uh, acclimated to getting back into uh, a, a social setting. So we'll put them in a dormitory style housing like that um, and just give them a chance to mingle with folks. It's a little bit, little bit easier. From day one, I knew I took the right step. The Massachusetts School of Law is challenging, but you feel welcomed and supported at every turn. You're learning the professional skills you need to get hired. From professors with real world experience. Trust me, that makes a huge difference. I now have a job I love, and the best part is, I'm not in debt. No LSAT is required. Teachers that make a difference at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law. Your future starts here. Let's talk a little bit about your community service programs because I've seen them on the side of the road picking up things. I've seen your anti-graffiti units. What are, are inmates uh, generally required to or required, or do they volunteer for community service programs as a means of obtaining good time credit? That's a great question. First of all, all the programs we have, um, it's it's voluntary. If an inmate wants to come up and just do his time and, and do nothing else, you know, they call it wrap up. They'll just wrap up their sentence, walk out the door. They don't want any services. They don't want any treatment. They're done with us. And that, that, that happens. The other ones, as we said, we try to throw the incentives, to, you know, that they will, they will uh, volunteer for these things. So, um, yeah, the community service thing is huge. Um, we have a, uh, what you see on the side of the highways, you'll see the van and you'll see, you know, guys with the uh, picking up the litter. We call them stick and picks. And they walk along and they, they, cl they clean the highways for us. Uh, the graffiti unit, anti graffiti unit. Um, right now, we just, we just actually took it offline for the winter because it's water-based and obviously you can't use it when it's during the winter because it'll freeze up, but we'll go along in the county um, and we'll clean up um, graffiti. Um, usually it has to be on you know, city-owned government or, or, or a, a town or, or city-owned property or a nonprofit. We, we won't do private businesses for obvious reasons. Um, but it's, we, we get a lot of work on it. And, and the beauty about what, what we promote with the communities is if you get something like an anti-Semitic or some type of vulgar thing written on the side of a building, call us. We'll have a crew up there the next morning. Mm -hmm. And my phone rings. It rang last week here at, and on a Sunday night. And, they, and they, they said, hey, Kevin, can we get the graffiti up there? We had it up by 8 o'clock the next morning to take care of something. How does accreditation work uh, in uh, your correctional facilities? And are, are you folks accredited? Yeah, we're, we're accredited. Well, one thing about correctional facilities, we are, uh, we, are, we are audited by so many agencies, I, I tend to lose track of it. Uh, obviously, we were audited by the Department of Corrections. That's like the, the mothership, so to speak, under state law. law. And then the uh, Department of Public Health comes in for obviously pu uh, public health issues here. We, we belong to uh, um, different various uh, national organizations. Uh, American Correctional Association is one where they are accredited. When you're accredited, it just means that you, you practice national best standards that have been, uh, you know, to, uh, that have been proven to, to be the best way to run a place. 
So they come in here and they go through this place from A to Z. Um, they check every policy, every procedure. They ch they check the cleanliness of, of, of the institution. They they check the, the inmates, uh, the cells themselves. They interview inmates. They interview staff. Um, they check the food quality, uh, lighting quality. You name it, they they check it. And then uh, it's a, it's a big task to be prepared for, and it's a big task to get through. So last year the, we were reaccredited, um, and we had to go down to New Orleans last night, just a year ago. Had to was go last. to New Orleans. Yeah, had to go to New Orleans. New Orleans in November, you know, but it was good. Let's turn to the modern correctional facilities, okay? What, tell, tell us about some of the recent criminal justice reforms that uh, affect the modern correctional facilities. Uh, I mentioned a, a good number of them between the medication treatment and the mental health, but um, some of the other, th other things they do, well, restrictive housing, like I said, that's been the big buzzword for a long time. Um, we talked a little bit about that, but now we, uh, by law, we're required to do a hearing every, every 72 hours on each case. Um, we do a little earlier. We do it Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, just to get into a regular routine. You know, on the weekends it might be the 72 hours, but mm -hmm. we're doing it three days a week. So anybody that goes into restrictive housing, because they are in there for 23 hours a day, um, because of whatever put them in there, you have to have a review panel to see how they're doing. And when I talk about review panel, it's not only correctional personnel, it's those mental health clinicians, the substance abuse clinicians, behavioral health folks. Um, we can even bring a chaplain, you know, into it. Whatever they, whatever we may need on that mm -hmm. panel to look at it from a, objectively, from every angle we can, to see what you know. Should this person remain in there? Should this person be doing something else? So um, that's tracked very closely, and we're always trying to keep the uh, the records, you know, together. So again, we're always building that plan for when they're when they're released. Another avenue that came up out of criminal justice reform is medical parole. Which is, uh, mm -hmm. which is, we, we've been doing it kind of unofficially. You know, it's usually you try to pull a favor in from somebody, but our inmates here, they, we have them from age 18 to 84. Um, so you get some folks that are later on in life, or God forbid they're suffering from a terminal, terminal illness, you know, whatever age. Um, a lot of them would, would rather go home, you know, before they, they, they pass away and just, you know, not to mm -hmm. die in a jail. So now the criminal justice reform allows us to, uh, to petition the court to get a medical parole and obviously under, under uh, a doctor's you know, uh, advice and then let that individual, might not be home, but they could go to a, a facility outside of a correctional facility to, to pass away. Another area that's been the big buzzword lately is, is transgender. There's a lot of talk about transgender. Um, honestly, it creates a lot of problem for us in the correctional facility. Um, I mean, this is a male facility. Right. You know, we bring in somebody who might be you know, halfway through the change or processing through the change. Um, it, it's a lot of logistical headaches. So, um, but under the new criminal justice reform, now we uh, we have to watch very closely when they arrive at intake um, how they declare themselves as to as to sex. Do they are they are, are they a man or are they a woman? And then we have to make sure we we, uh, we accommodate them as as best we can. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the other thing that struck me about that uh, with respect to health care needs as they advance and the like. The last time I was here. Uh, I had never quite thought of it, but what about prisoners with significant disabilities? There were a couple that we saw that were in wheelchairs and the like. I mean, you have to take care of the same population that's out there, but now on a, in a, on a much more difficult basis, yeah. it would seem. It's, that's another great question. Our population is aging. So right. Because aging brings illness. Right. So we do hospital runs, um, you know, routinely. I mean, on an average day, hopefully we have just two or three individuals at a hospital. I could have seven out of the day. It's costly because every time an inmate goes to the hospital, I have to send two correctional officers mm -hmm. on overtime. So you can see where the, 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 uh, mm -hmm. the dollars add up. But um, we just, we, we put out our health care provider. We were contracted with a private company. Um, it cost me about eight and a half million dollars a year to provide medical care through this health care company. But what we did was we asked them to do a lot of the services here in house. Like we had a uh, we have a dialysis machine on site here. So oh really? You know, we don't have to. We actually have two of them. We don't have to bring the inmates out to a wow. hospital. We can do it here. So little things like that. As much of the level of care that we can provide here, we will. But you know, when obviously emergencies come up, there's cardiac issues, there's diabetics, there's whatever. You know, we we have to take them back and forth to the doctors and stuff. It, it adds up. Um, on time and, and you know the uh, logistics of it all to get it coordinated. Some complain that the cost for a, a prisoner to use a telephone or the commissary that, that we're making a profit there. Uh, to what extent do, uh, is that true or are we really trying to keep the cost low? It's just another service that needs to be paid for. 
that uh, well, actually we, we just lowered our phone rates. Um, we, we provided a new, new uh, we just brought in a new vendor. We renegotiated a contract, got a, got a better rate. Now when I came up here, what they used to do is for the first minute of a call it was two dollars and sixty five cents. Yeah, that's outrageous. So if so you inmate calls somebody and you get a voice, you get a, a, an answering machine, it just costing two dollars and sixty five cents. That's nuts. I'm sorry, it's yep. nuts. So we we revamped the, the, the program. We we lowered it to I think it's eighteen cents a, a minute across the board. You do some quick math. An old uh, average phone call is about thirty minutes. So one phone call would a thirty minute phone call used to be seven dollars. It's now five dollars and forty cents, I believe. So um, it's it's better. But what we'll, every dime that we earn through uh, the, 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 these fees, we put into inmate programming. Mm -hmm. um, we don't spend it on cruises. We don't spend it on personnel or, or, or equipment. It goes back into, into programming. So what we're doing now, um, we're going to tablets. So right now, if you go to a housing unit, there's, there's uh, two pay phones on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, they like pay phones. You know, and obviously, we have to control the, 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 the use of the phones because there's a lot of restraining orders out against individuals here, and we don't want them violating the restraining orders. So there's a lot to this. So now with the new system is we're in the process of bringing these new tablets in, and we hope to see them right after the first of the year. So it'll be like a push cot. So um, the inmates can take the, uh, can take the tablet and make phone calls right there. So instead of just two people at a time, we can get you know multiple people making mm -hmm. phone calls at a time. Then we want to take it to the next level where we're going to take, to take the tablets then and we're going to program them. So I talked about some of the educational and the vocational right. programs. So we can, we can put modules on the tablets so when the inmates are, are in their cells and downtime, they can actually watch you know, these modules to help their, their rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And again, if they do it, they can get time off their, their sentence or whatever credit they get and, and, then, and then move from there. Um, and then a little bit later, hopefully by next spring or something, I want to do video visitation. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but you should see the folks that come up here on a daily basis to, to visit the inmates. Um, we average about 36,000 people here that come up to, to visit wow. you know, up the inmates um, all, all day and, and into the evening. Um, the taxi cabs, the Ubers coming up, um, and a lot of these folks are coming from, you know, uh, you know, and we're, we're quasi-centered in the county. Sure. So they come from all over the place, and a lot of these folks, this, that's a big expense. So we're going to move to video visitation where, um, all prearranged for security purposes, but you can sit at your home and you can, you can speak to an inmate, like FaceTime. Sure. And then you can do it right over a computer, and they have those tablets, and they can have those 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 conversations, you know, without bringing the family up here. Sure. And when you see little kids coming in here to see dad, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it gets a little 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 uncomfortable sometimes. So. But this will give them the face-to-face -face interaction. The face-to-face -face interaction. And we're already doing just to jump back on another topic, if I could, uh, we're video conferencing with the courts right now. We're the first county in, in in Massachusetts to bring in video conferencing with all our district courts. So um, if we have in inmates here, traditionally we've got to throw them in a van, you know, and drive them to, to the district court, you know, they've got to go into the court offices, they've got to watch them uh, over there. Now um, we have rooms set up in inside the facility where uh, the attorney can either come here and do it or be in the court and speak to, the, to his or her client um, from the court. And then when the judge, you know, has the session, whether it's uh, just a, a status hearing or whatever it might be, um, they, uh, they can do it by, by, by video been very, very successful. Uh, from a security point of view, it's great because we don't have to take everybody out. Uh, Cost-wise, obviously, it's reducing transportation costs and, you know, wear and tear in the vehicles and fuel like that. The courts are happy because they don't have to worry about, you know, um, delays in traffic or, you know, uh, construction accidents, what might hold up the vans. Um, and it's, it, it seems to be working, so we're going to do more and more of that. You've been sheriff now for three years. The law enforcement uh, for your entire career. Yeah. What are some of the reforms you're most proud of uh, that you've helped to institute here during the last three years and look forward to instituting in the next three? What I'm most proud of, this medication-assisted treatment is huge. Um, it, it's, it's, as I said before, it's a huge paradigm shift and part of it's difficult to get the staff to, to, to adapt to it too. As I said earlier, they've been, for decades, they've been trying to keep this stuff out and now we're administering it to them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you sell that? I don't care what business of it is, that's a major change. So I'm proud of the staff for, 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 for doing that. Um, Reentry is my thing. Um, when, when I came up here, I really, when I was campaigning and when I came up here, I really wanted to promote that. So these programs we talked about, uh, I think are huge. Uh, oh, one of the other things I, I forgot to, to talk about is, um, because of my police background, we still have a lot of you know, contacts with the, the local chiefs of police. 
And they have formed a, uh, a coalition of all the chiefs uh, in the county who have signed a, a memorandum agreement where they, they're working together to prevent overdoses. So a number of them are my graduates, you know. Oh, yes, yes, that's <laughs> right. That's right. And you've got a few graduates who work for me, too. <laughs> too no. But they, uh, so now they're sharing information on overdoses. So we, we hooked up with that, co that coalition. And so when and somebody's leaving here, we share information about our releases with all the police departments but particularly these individuals that are assigned to each, each police department who are focusing on, on the, uh, the, the substance abuse uh, folks that are coming out. So they help us watch. So we're actually handing off to the police departments. When you look at reentry, families are huge. You gotta keep them to get together. It's a monumental task, because as I said before, a lot of them are already estranged from their families. Um, but those that aren't, you just gotta try and help them rebuild. So having them be, being able to, to contact them while they're here um, obviously helps with their mental health. It helps them, you know, hopefully the families encourage them to participate in the programs um, and, 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 you know, help them to, to be successful. Taking the first step towards your legal career can be an overwhelming task at many other law schools. Lucky for you, the Massachusetts School of Law is not one of those schools. Applying is easy, no LSATs required, scheduling is flexible with daytime and evening classes, and learning is remarkably rewarding since all of our professors have real world experience. All of this and much more at the most affordable law school in New England. The Massachusetts School of Law, your future starts here. Welcome back. Daniel Gary has served his time and is now heading out to rebuild his life. He explains how he ended up here. Um, I have a, a history um, due to a toxic relationship that keeps putting me back in here. Um, drug use plays a part in it. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that in no way, shape, or form is this my parents' fault. Um, I, was raised, I was raised in a good home. I had good parents. My behavior is not a reflection of them. Um, I like to make that very clear. Um, I put myself in this position and uh, got no one to blame but myself for a lifetime of bad decisions. Yeah, we see that. I mean, it, 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 it crosses a broad spectrum of folks and oftentimes a lot of bad choices along the way uh, ends up here. What, what do you, how long do you presently um, uh, have with respect to serve here? Um, I'm currently doing a two-year sentence. Is this the first time you've been incarcerated? No, sir. This is probably my, my fourth incarceration sentence. So why is this one going to be different uh, than the last three? It's a great question. Um, a lot's happened that's different this time around. Um, 41 years old, I've done a lot of growing up this time. I've taken a hard look at myself. The way things have played out, a lot of things have gone differently. Um, things have happened in this sentence that haven't happened before. I've put myself in position to succeed, um, whereas before I've just kind of gone through the motions. Well, how? What have you done this time to, in order to succeed so that this time will be the, 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 the time that you don't end up coming back and seeing these folks? I was a lot more proactive in my approach this time instead of just sitting around and um, wasting time. I did as many um, programs as I possibly could like what ones? I became a peer leader for the detox, mm -hmm. um, which was a huge, huge thing for me as far as confidence building and public speaking has always been a huge fear of mine. And um, I was able to get over that and it went quite well. Um, some of the moments that we had over there in our groups that I facilitated, people who witnessed it, you could say it was a miracle. You could say, you know, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. Um, guys trusted me in, in my approach to trying to help them and it made me believe in myself and believe in what I was doing when I was actually doing it for a very selfish purpose to get a certificate to try to get something that I could gain from it. It turned out being so much more than that. Um, I, I ended up believing in my philosophy that I was trying to teach them and I told them I wouldn't let them down and you know it went a long way for me as far as not letting them down and staying on the path that I'm trying to go on and, and leading them by example. Um, 
uh, what about the educational programs uh, in addition to, to that? Have you taken advantage of any of those services here that, that are going to be uh, the key to your success next time? Possibly. Um, I missed out on a couple of opportunities that offer college credits. Um, I'm seriously thinking about going back to school when I get out of here, possibly even becoming a drug and alcohol counselor um, with the success I had at the facilitating the detox went so well that I've actually mulled it over as far as doing that. I missed the opportunity for that. I think what the jail is doing as far as that is a good thing. And what do you think about the, the keys will be when upon your release to be able to stay away from the, the drugs and the bad choices? There's no really clear-cut, easy answer to that. It's up to the individual. Um, you know, somebody told me I needed to come back to jail because I needed the structure and I just thought that was insane. But, you know, a support system structure is important to uh, to stay on the path. Something I did on the street that was not court ordered was a fatherhood program. I did two. I did one in Lawrence and then one out of Bradford DCF offices. Something I truly believe in. Something that I will be going back to. That's a great support system and structure. Do you have kids? I do. How difficult is that to spend your time here with your, your children out there? It's extremely difficult. It's part of the reason why I'm doing this interview right now. Um, when it was broken down to me as to what would be going on here, if I could save somebody the, the torment of having to deal with this situation and mostly to prevent my kids or any kids from having to follow in these, in these footsteps, um, I'm all about that because my stepson is barely a teen teenager. I can see him following this kind of lifestyle. I can see him ending up in here. I see him and a lot of these young kids that I see around here today. And, you know, I'll do everything in my power to stop that because I don't think he realizes what, what goes on. You know, it's not a game. What do you wish you knew at 20 that you now know at 40? You know, I really wish that I, uh, I lived up to my potential. I wish I didn't waste the time. It goes by so quick. Um, when you're 20 years old, you think 20 years is a lifetime and a galaxy away, but you wake up one day and you're 40, and it goes by so quick, and it's, it's what you do with your time. I wasted a lot of time. I wasted a lot of time with my kids. Um, I've let them down. I've let myself down. I'm sick of letting people down, especially my kids. Um, it's not just the individual who's incarcerated that suffers. It's, it's the collateral damage. It's, it's the children. It could be elderly parents that provide, you know, you provide an income or even take care of them if they're sick. And you come in here and it's not just the, the guilty party that's being punished, it's, it's the outside individuals, the families. If you had some control over additional services or assistance that you think either you or other prisoners could benefit from, what, what, what would you like to see offered in that regard? You know, it's... You're reaching out to an audience that honestly doesn't want to listen, but we've got to try to give these kids a chance. Um, give them some sort of skills other than, you know, the same old, same old. Um, mm -hmm. Give them, offer a trade maybe. I don't know. Give them a chance to get out there and, and to, to change their lives around. Um, the way things are in society these days, Everything's about instant gratification. Nobody wants to work for anything anymore. Um, maybe I'm just old and I'm an old goat, but you know I was raised with with values, and if anything's worth having, you got to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. People today just want to hand it to them. Um, they want to live a lifestyle where it's it's a rap video, you know, treating women disrespectfully. You know, instead of getting a job, drug dealing, people have no problem picking up a gun and killing somebody instead of you know stand on their own these days it's just crazy what I see and what I hear every day Do you have a plan for getting back to the basics so that when you do leave here um, that you've got some job skills or some jobs in mind that you think that you'll be able to become a contributing member and not have to ever come back here fortunately I do have um, an extensive background with trades and whatnot I've always had good jobs you know I'm trying to use my mind more this time instead of my back um, at 41, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta, I got to come up with some sort of another plan. Uh, even though the back is so strong, it's not going to hold out forever. So, you know, school. I, I'm, I'm honestly thinking about going back to school, Good. getting an education. I'm a high school dropout, but, you know, I'm educated in my own ways. Um, 
So why don't you get your high school, why don't you get I, the equivalent right now? I, I got it back in 96. Oh, congrats. Right after dropping out of high school, I, I, Good. I got my GED and went straight to work. So as far as a higher education would be something I'm interested in. Um, honestly, I am a productive member of society. I just, I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I've got a bad temper. Um, I don't, I don't, I react things very rashly, very um, quickly. Uh, I don't think things through. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think about the, the consequences, so to speak. Um, you know, in my older age, I'm slowing down a little bit, and I mm -hmm. just got to start thinking about the, the consequences for my actions, um, what's going to happen if I react a certain way. So I always say I'm never coming back, but yet I keep winding back, and that's a million-dollar question is why do we keep coming back? Because since my first incarceration, I see nothing but the same faces, and it's like a reunion, so to speak, and it's not in a good thing because I don't want to see these people coming back there, you know, they are good people, some of them, and uh, it seems like once we come here, we keep coming back, and we got to stop that. The jails are overcrowded and filled, and it's not getting any better. Well, and that, that's what you do have to really put some focus on, is if about half of the people end up back here, how are you going to end up in the half that never comes back here? I wish I had the answer for that, because I've been asking myself that every time. Um, I've tried to make reminders. I've hung things on the wall. Remind is my bracelet. Um, it's going to sound crazy, but when you get out of here within maybe three or four hours, this seems like a dream. No matter how much you want to relive the horrible experiences so you don't come back here, it's like it never happened um, until you do come back and then it all hits you at once. Just coming up Manning Ave in the back of a police cruiser hits me. The smells when I come in, the sounds, the keys, the locks, it all comes flooding back. But when you know you get out of here, it's, it's, it's so quickly you forget. And um, it's tough because uh, I don't want to come back, you know, especially at my age, especially with all the, the time I've lost with my kids. I want to get back and live the next part of my life, so to speak, the downswing of my life, not in here. The first time I visited a prison, I was surprised that firearms aren't used to a greater extent to keep order. But when you think that through, there are good reasons why weapons, even by corrections officers, are in short supply in a prison. Canines and common sense are a correction officer's best weapons. Okay, well I think when we talk about the use of canines, is there's actually two different uh, um, aspects that we use them. They're, they're used on the outside to uh, help the local communities and whatnot, but uh, when you're referring to the inside, in, in fact inside uh, the Middleton facility, uh, our main uh, usage is, uh, is they're a deterrent. As you can see the layout of this facility, we're kind of like an open campus, almost like a ranch style campus where the buildings are separated by large portions of open areas. So what we do is we have the dogs stand back when, and off to the side and okay what we call movement. So when movement comes out of a certain housing unit and they have to come to maybe to the gym or maybe to the programs building or maybe they're going to go to uh, the infirmary or even to the dining hall where there's large amounts of inmates at one time, there's always a possibility for some type of disturbance to happen. And it's one thing if the disturbance happens inside a unit, we can contain it, we can control it, we can push them into their cells and, and just secure the doors and, and deal with it that way. But when they're out here, it's really good to have something like the dog standing by, at least one or two of them standing by, so the inmates see them when they come out and they say, you know, if something were to happen out here in the yard, we would be able to use the dog in a crowd control um, environment and kind of push them back and get them on the ground or maybe use these basketball courts here. And I'm assuming that the inmates are a little bit concerned about having the dogs let go on them. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. That's all probably in the back of their mind, and that, again, is part of the deterrence. We right. always want to handle things without going hands-on yeah. or making zero contact at all. Of course, we train to uh, deploy the dogs in that fashion, but we would never actually just let the dogs go. Certainly. That's kind of an old folklore. Oh, and they set the dogs on us. That really this is not happen. TV, right? No, no, it's really not. Uh, they're always in control of the handlers. They're always on two different collars, hooked to the same leash, uh, and the leash is always secured around the handler's hand. So it's, uh, and a lot of training goes into that too, a lot of control work. So what the handler's doing now, he's gonna get his dog out of his, out of his uh, vehicle. He's gonna come over to search this, the exterior of this vehicle. Uh, and, and again, it's all about routine with these dogs. So when this dog comes out of this guy, he's obviously being clicked to a certain collar, so he's gonna kinda know what he's supposed to be doing. The handler is also gonna sit him in a, per, in a certain spot on the vehicle, and he's also gonna give him his verbal command of what to do. So the dog's gonna know right off the bat exactly what we're doing, just from this same pattern. This is exactly how we train this dog Patton here and his handle will always start at the right front headlight of a vehicle and they do their initial sweep. So we'll watch him do that. He gives his command. 
And again, this is nice, a nice loose leash. He's not correcting the dog. He's going to let him find it on his own. Because if we can get it right away on his own, just kind of circling the car, that's great. And it looks like he might have something here. You're going to see, obviously, there's a change in behavior here. He's active. And then when you get to what we call a final response, is that sick. Keep a hide on the uh, passenger side of the tire. And then, boom, the dog gets his reward. And he gets his reward with that towel. And the towel is used instead of a rough toy or a hard toy because it's soft. He can play tug of war. And the handler gets, in, gets to engage him with it and play with him with it. And that's all what this is about. We're making the dog happy. The dog recognizes the scent. He knows, hey, if I sit when I recognize that scent, he's going to give me that towel. And this is what I really want. It's all he wants. The reason we use the lab, and I, I should have explained this earlier, is that the lab, uh, it's a very passive dog. When he indicates, he sits. And my shepherd also sits. But the shepherd can, also has a lot of patrol training and a lot of aggression training in him, which is needed for the patrol work. But at the same time, uh, he sometimes will get bitey and scratchy at where the narcotics are. So we use the lab when we search people, there's no chance of any accidental scratching, any accidental biting. So we'll use the lab for when we search visitors or, or whoever he has um, lined up to do that day. Tell us how many dogs you have here. So currently here at the Estes County Sheriff's Department, we have a 14 canine unit team. Now a canine uh, team consists of one handler and one dog. Uh, each handler has their own dog. That, ha that dog comes home with that particular handler. He has his own vehicle so he can respond to the outside agencies to lend mutual aid and whatnot, as well as respond if there's any major uprisings or anything like that. So we have um, 11 German Shepherds. We have uh, one uh, passive lab uh, retriever. I'm sure you've seen him I earlier. I saw him earlier. Our, our specialty canine uh, Patton, which is a lab. And then we also have three that are still in their training right now that are Belgian Malamalas. So this is Canine Dash. He's a seven-year-old German Shepherd. He's been with the department since he's been about 11 months old. And uh, what we're going to do today is I'm just going to show you, demonstrate how the dog apprehends. And uh, apprehension is, is the, uh, the word we use when he actually goes ahead and he, and he latches on and bites on to the suspect. Now, we train him to do that in certain areas on the suspect. Generally, we train him to bite in the arms or in the legs. And the reason for that is that these are nice, thick parts of the body. We don't want to cause too much damage to the suspect. We just want him to bite and hold. And you'll hear me say that a few other times. He bites and holds until we can come over, take the dog off, put the handcuffs on the suspect. And that's basically how this works. Um, one thing before we do this, I just want to be clear, is that uh, they're not these attack dogs that you think, the, 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 the days of old when these dogs were literally attacking and attacking and biting people. That's not what these dogs do. That's not what you're trained to do, and that's definitely not what we want them to do. Um, like I said before, these dogs are trained to bite and hold and you're going to see that they'll bite in this one particular area and they'll just hold right there they will not come off that bite they'll stay right on there the whole time until i come up and give him a command to take off or i come up and i verbally take him off so we'll go ahead up on the hill here and i'll have my decoy come around the other side and we'll show you how uh, dash here apprehend somebody hey suspect i see you over there come here let me see your hands right now come up from behind that car good boy you watch him show me your hands stop right there don't run stay right there Fuck it. Get him. You're going to see how he apprehends. Good boy. Now, again, we're a team. Good dog. Yeah, good buddy. Yeah, that's a good dog. Good boy. That's a good dog. Where do you get the dogs from, and where are they trained? So we get the dogs from a lot of different breeders and a lot of different uh, brokers around the Boston area and the Northeast. Sometimes we even go as far as Rhode Island, but it all depends on who has the, the supply when it comes time to put some on. We recently just lost a couple of our handlers to retirements, so we replaced kind of three of them all at once, and we had to get them from two different breeders. Um, one of them was East Coast Canine, and there was another one down in Raynham that we used. So once we purchase the dogs, and they all come guaranteed and warranted, once we purchase the dogs, they go to the Boston Police Canine Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a 16 week long patrol academy. And we say patrol, but it, it encompasses a lot of the work that the dog does, except for the narcotic works. That's a separate school. Okay. So we start them out with training. They go to the 16 weeks with the Boston Police. When they come out, they're patrol certified, and they're certified to work inside these jails, certified to work and help out in the streets. Thanks to the staff of the Essex County Sheriff's Department, and especially to Sheriff Coppinger. Thank you for joining us. We hope this program taught you a little bit about incarceration that you may not have known. I am your host, Michael Coyne. Until next time.